Um, so welcome to the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum's virtual speaker series for March 2024. Uh, my name is Dr. Emily Bamforth. I'm the curator here. And we are very happy today to welcome our March speaker. Um, this is Sally Hurst, who is coming all the way from Australia to speak with us today. She's still in Australia, but she's zooming in with us from uh, Australia. Um, Sally is going to talk about a very interesting and exciting project that she's involved with in Australia. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on Sally. Um, she has a both a bachelor's and a master's degree from Macquarie University in Australia. Um, and she's done some education work, uh, some preparation work. She's been a tour guide. Um, she has a really cool website if you get a chance to check it out. Um, certainly, definitely worth a visit. Um, and if you have questions during the, the presentation, please just pop them into the Zoom chat um, and we'll get Sally uh, to address them afterwards. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Sally and I will turn off my camera. Amazing. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Okay, that should all be sharing now. So thank you so much, Emily and the museum for having me. Um, my name is Sally Hurst, and I run something called the Found a Fossil Project. So today's talk is a little bit about how the project contributes to discovering dinosaurs and protecting the past in Australia. So just to give you a little bit of background on who I am, I am an adjunct fellow with Macquarie University in Sydney. I recently completed my master's of research, which had a focus on paleontology, archeology span and science communication to the public. Um, I'm an educator at the Australian Museum and occasionally get to go out into the field in places like Dinosaur Provincial Park. Um, and hopefully we'll be visiting up um, to the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum later in August this year as well. So one of the main things that I do as well is I run the Founder Fossil Project. So while this is a website, it's also a research project that originally came from my Masters of Research. And it stemmed around this idea of if you ever discovered a dinosaur, maybe in your backyard, maybe in a national park or on your property, what would you do with it? Who would you actually tell about this find? Now, in places like Alberta, it's actually pretty clear about what you are meant to do and who you can contact. The Royal Terrell Museum has this great website, found a fossil, here's what to do, here's the legislation that actually applies, and here is a direct email address for who you can actually contact. But unfortunately, in Australia, we have nothing like this. We do have state museums in all of our states and territories. But because finding fossils maybe isn't quite as common as in places like Alberta, the communication to the public is actually quite lacking. So if we take uh, Queensland, so in the northeast of the country, as a bit of an example, if you want to go and find fossils, you need a fossicking license. It's free, I think, to apply or only about $10. And you can only dig in designated fossicking areas unless you are on your own property. Now, on the rules of the government website that gives out these permits, it does say that you are not allowed to collect any vertebrate fossils. But it doesn't actually specify, oh, if you do happen to dig up a vertebrate fossil like a diprotodon, so a giant wombat that we used to have, or a dinosaur, here's who you can actually contact. Now, if you're in paleontology and in museum studies, generally you'll go Queensland Museum, no brainer, that's who I can contact. But if you are a farmer or someone who maybe isn't quite in the field, it can be pretty tricky trying to find that information actually written down anywhere. And if we compare that to somewhere like New South Wales, which is where I'm from, it's a different story again. So in New South Wales, fossils are only protected if they are within a national park. Now, they're not actually protected under any specific legislation of themselves, but they're protected along with everything else in a national park. So the same way you can't desecrate trees or you can't take rocks or shells from beaches that are in national parks, you're not allowed to touch or destroy fossils either. 
But this does mean that if you are outside of a national park, if you do find something on your property, there's no legal requirement to report it. And there's no legal uh, recompense, say, if you do end up accidentally or purposefully destroying that dinosaur. Now, you might think, oh gosh, that's horrible. Who would ever do that? But in places like Lightning Ridge, which is in the north uh, west of New South Wales, this is where we have opal mines. Now, these mines are um, owned and operated by local people. They generally buy a 10 by 10 meter squared lease and anything that comes out of the ground of their mine belongs to them. Now, as opal is a pretty precious gemstone, it actually has more value as jewelry than it does as a fossil that you can give to a museum. So again, there's not actual any legal recompense or legal requirement to report or to keep these fossils intact. Now, if we take a look at the legislation across the rest of the country, it looks like there's actually a bit of protection out there. Um, unfortunately, in some places like Victoria, fossils aren't protected or mentioned at all. Um, places like South Australia, again, it, it looks like there's a lot protecting it, but the thing that most of these different acts have in common is that they are incredibly vague. So even if you find the right act, even if you figure out, okay, I'm in a national park or I'm on my own property, it won't often specify, right, here's who you can contact, here are the clear steps of what to do. Now, legislation itself is also quite technical in language. So even if, again, you did find the right section in the right act, understanding what it actually says can be incredibly difficult. And so when I was trying to figure out if I found a fossil, what should I actually do? It was really hard to try and figure this out. So I figured if I had a degree in paleontology and archeology span and couldn't figure this out, then a farmer who might not have an academic background, again, it would be really hard to find this information. Now, while Australia isn't quite the dinosaur mecca that places like Alberta are, we do have some amazing dinosaurs. We have ones like Fostoria, our Matabarasaurus, and sauropods like Savannosaurus. Now, something that all of these dinosaurs have in common is that none of them were discovered by scientists. All of these were discovered by farmers or miners who discovered the fossils and contacted a museum um, and was able to continue doing research on this dinosaur. So Fostoria is named after Robert Foster, who was the miner who discovered the bones. Matabarasaurus langdoni is named after Doug Langdon, who was a grazier, um, he owned sheep, and he literally stumbled over the bones and that's how he discovered the dinosaur. And Savannosaurus elatorium is discovered, was discovered by David Elliott, and he was actually so interested in these dinosaur finds that he has now founded a museum in outback Queensland called the Age of Dinosaurs Museum. And he and his workers continue to do a lot of the field work associated um, with the dinosaurs that we have found in Australia and in Queensland. So this goes to show that not only are the everyday public potentially finding dinosaurs, they're interested and they wanna be involved in the next steps of research, but sometimes they may not be sure quite how they can connect. And so again, when it comes to what people would actually search for on Google if they were trying to find this information, when I initially did this Google at the start of the project, I left more confused than when I started. A lot of the websites I was finding were for Alberta or for in the UK. There wasn't really anything that was Australian specific. But now, hopefully, when people Google, I found a fossil. My website will come up and it does provide clear guidelines on what to do if people actually discover something. Now, while the website is just one part of the project, the other half is the research that I was doing during my masters. And in this research, we had a few main aims. And the first was to find out what do Australians actually think about the discovery and protection, both of fossils, but also indigenous artifacts. In Australia, you're probably just as likely to find a fossil as you are something like an Aboriginal stone tool. So while the preservation and significance of these objects is clearly very different, 
they are things that both can be found across the Australian landscape. And people may not always know one from the other, especially when it does come to stone tools and smaller hand fossils. Some people may not have the fossil literacy to tell them apart. But the hope was to use the data that we collect from the everyday Australian to find out what are the barriers to protecting this heritage. And hopefully we can then provide some solutions for this protection as well. So thinking about this first aim, how do we figure out what Australians think? I released an Australia wide survey at the beginning of 2022. It was open for about five to six months. And honestly, I was hoping for about 200 people to do this survey. If you've ever been to a shopping centre and you get harassed by someone with a clipboard wanting you to do a survey, you know how hard it can be to get people to participate in your research. So I set a relatively low bar, but still something that had a big enough sample size that we could get some pretty interesting responses. Now, when I was doing this survey, this was still during the time of some of the COVID lockdowns and travel restrictions. So I made sure that it was available online so people could complete it wherever they were in the country. And because it was digital, I also wanted to make sure we did a lot of advertising. So the most amount of people could see it, farmers could see it, miners could see it, and they could have their say about um, this heritage material. So I ended up posting in many, many, many Facebook community groups. And this was everything from hiking Queensland to what's your favourite flower or gardeners, uh, New South Wales, anything I could think of that related to people being outdoors and on country. And I was also sending lots of emails to special interest groups, to government departments, Aboriginal land councils, geological societies, again, hoping that they could share this survey with their networks as well. I also did a series of sponsored social media posts and on Facebook alone, they had a reach of over 150,000 people. Now, not all of these people would have been Australian, but it was good to see that social media could have such a reach in this project. Now, I'm also very big into science communication, so just posting a little blurb about the project wasn't quite enough. So I was able to go on radio a number of times, again, in quite rural and regional places. So hopefully those farmers and miners would actually hear about the project. I was able to travel quite extensively to lots of regional and rural museums, which talk about fossils and Aboriginal artifacts. I got to do some talks at my work at the Australian Museum. This was specifically for their dinosaur festival, um, as well as lectures at places like the University of New England and for the Australian Heritage Festival. And those emails that were sent out to lots of different groups also paid off as I got to be published in a farming magazine called Outback. Um, local newsletters and even government department websites. Now, all of those responses and all of that advertising did pay off as I had people from all over the country contribute to the project. And so instead of the 200 we were aiming for, I actually had over 1300 people contribute to this research. So we ended up having a really robust sample size. And so hopefully results um, can mean a lot more than what they initially may have. And one of the questions we were initially asking in this project was, if you actually found something that you knew was a dinosaur fossil or you knew was any kind of fossil, would you actually tell anyone, yes or no? And it was really good to see that over 70% of people said, yeah, I'd tell someone. And it was quite interesting as well that women were significantly more likely to report than men. Um, it was the only demographic predictor of reporting that was significant. So things like age, educational background and occupation, none of those actually had a significant impact on if someone would or wouldn't report. So we had a big group of people who said, yeah, I'd report a fossil. But when we started asking them, okay, who would you report to? This is where things started to get a little bit messy. So if we take a look at fossils, we can see that museums were clearly the top choice. Now, seeing as in Australia, most of the time there is no legal requirement to report your fossil finds. It was really good that people had identified the museum as a trusted place they could go to for this information. 
But if we do compare this to Aboriginal artefacts, it looks very, very different. Now, the top answer is clearly your local Indigenous community. Who better could advise on the heritage of an area than the people who have lived there for literally tens of thousands of years? However, enter colonialism. Under most Australian state law, it is actually your state heritage body who you are meant to contact about Aboriginal artefact finds. So about 90% of people actually got this wrong. Now, the reason I point this out is because, because legally there are legislative requirements to report Aboriginal finds, there are dedicated government departments to the protection of Aboriginal heritage in each state and territory of Australia. Yet, the communication to the public is still obviously so lacking that again, 90% of people got wrong who you are supposed to talk to. So even if fossils were awarded the same level of protection under legislation, even if they had their own dedicated government departments, doesn't mean that the communication to the public would actually happen in an effective way. Now, this was also really proved when we asked people, what would stop you from reporting a heritage find? Now, the top answer for fossils was actually, well, it may not be a significant find worth reporting. I don't want to waste anyone's time if it is a really common fossil or if it is accidentally just a rock. But when we compare that to the second answer for fossils, but the top answer for Aboriginal artefacts, the top answer was that I do not know who to contact. And the fact, again, that Aboriginal heritage has more people saying I do not know compared to fossils really shows that just because you have government involvement um, or protection doesn't mean that it's going to be communicated well. Now, speaking of this poor communication again, something worth noting in Australia is that our land mass is about 6.7 million square kilometres. We're a pretty big country. We're not quite as big as Canada, I will admit. We're about 2.2 million square kilometres smaller than Canada, but we're still pretty big. And of our land mass, more than 50% is dedicated to agricultural use. So this means that farmers by sheer scale are probably going to be the most likely people to stumble across fossils or Aboriginal artifacts. But when we take a look at farmers compared to the main population of who would report, we can see that farmers would report things about 20% less than the rest of the population. Now, in this particular case, we can actually draw this back to a particular, leg particular legislative act. In 1993, the Native Title Act was introduced across Australia. And this basically meant that if Aboriginal people could prove a continuing connection to a particular land, generally it had to be vacant crown lands that you know, didn't have a private lease on it, then they could have a title over that land. Sometimes the land use wouldn't always change depending on the agreement of the local Aboriginal people and the government or whoever owns that land. But it perpetuated this really big myth that if you found Aboriginal cultural heritage or artifacts on your property, your land could be taken away from you. Now, this is, it is a myth. This can't actually happen. But 30 years of the government not really doing a good job at correcting this information means that even now, farmers have a really big fear of their land being taken away, which again, colonialism, very ironic, I know, but it is a big fear to have your land being taken away from you. And so even if farmers don't really know if what they found is Aboriginal, or maybe it is actually a fossil and they've confused the two, it means that things aren't being reported. So there might be a number of amazing dinosaur or fossil specimens that have been found by farmers, but they've not told anyone about them because of this fear, which again is because of the poor communication of this legislation. Now, when I actually ask people about the legislation itself, I ask them to agree or disagree with the statement, I feel confident that any existing laws in my state adequately protect fossils or fossil sites. Now, a minority of people agreed with this. They're like, yeah, it's doing a pretty good job. 40% of people disagreed with this statement saying that the current state laws are not adequate. 
but this left a really big number of people who just said, I don't, I don't know enough about the legislation to agree or disagree. Now, again, this isn't actually that surprising considering some states don't have any fossil related legislation at all. But again, how can we communicate this information better to the general public? So within the Founder Fossil Survey, I created a blog, a website, a video, a social media post and a brochure. And people could opt in for this section. It would ask them to read or watch one of these formats and then provide some feedback on if they found it engaging, if they found it informative. And it was a really sneaky way to actually get people learning about what to do. Um, and then also hopefully providing some feedback that we can use later. Now within specifically the blog and the video, I really made an effort to try and include some storytelling elements. And some of this was as simple as imagine yourself walking across the sand or walking through the Australian bush and you stumble over something and maybe it is a new fossil or an indigenous artifact. And the reason I wanted to include elements like this was because by listening to, watching or reading a story, it uses up a lot of mental faculties and cognitive resources and it reduces an audience's capacity to intercept, react to and argue against any messages or information that might be within that content, which they may well argue against if it's presented in a non narrative format, such as a peer reviewed article or a lecture. And so getting onto the level of what people would actually enjoy what would make them remember these formats was really important for the project and going forward. Now, another question we actually asked people about this section was for anyone who had originally said, no, I wouldn't report a fossil find. We asked them, okay, you've now watched a video or you've read a brochure. Now, would you report a fossil find? Now, only about 50% of people changed their minds. And from the feedback, there was definitely room for improvement with this, but this equates to about 80 people. So that might be 80 new heritage discoveries that are now gonna be reported or protected just because someone took part in an eight minute survey from a graduate student. So if this survey and this project can have that rate of change, I would love to see what a museum or a government funded awareness campaign could do in this space. And thinking of the role of museums in this space, a last result I want to share is when we ask people, what information sources do you trust? And over 90% of people agree that they would trust information from museums. Now, if we compare this to something like government websites, we can see that there is actually quite a bit of distrust in government websites, even though they are supposed to be the sources of information we can go to about these heritage protections. So museums generally um, or will have a very big role to play in the communication of this information to the public going forward. But in the meantime, until our museums can do better, the Founder Fossil Project and website remains. So this project and website, it has laws for both fossil finds and indigenous finds. They're broken down state by state. So every state and territory in Australia is covered. It outlines, this is the actual legislation that applies in your area and for your particular land type. But it also has, this is what it actually means in layman's terms. So taking all of those technical language um, and words out of it. So anyone can understand this if they find something. It does also have these guidelines for heritage finds, and that includes a list very similar to what the Royal Terrell Museum had. So things like taking a photo, leaving it where it is, uh, logging it with a GPS and contacting somewhere like a museum for identification and potentially future research if it is a big find. And before I created this website, this information had never been in a central platform like this in Australia ever before. Now, the unintended consequence of creating a hopefully really good website like this is that now many people of the general public think that I'm qualified to identify all of their finds. 
Now, I'm very honest, I've done my masters, as you've seen, more so in the science communication side of things rather than taphonomy and different fossil groups. So even if I don't necessarily know how to identify something, I do generally know lots of people who can identify it. But I also get some quite interesting queries that are sent to me. Now, I will preface this with I definitely do get people sending me photos of real fossils and real artifacts and we can talk to museums or local Aboriginal land councils and we've had some really good success stories. But the next ones I wanted to show you are just a bit of fun to show you some of the imaginative um, kind of creations of the general public. So this first picture, this is a snapshot from Google Maps and I think it's a mountain range somewhere in Afghanistan. I'm not actually quite sure, but the man who sent this thought he had discovered the biggest snake fossil in the world. You can kind of see that the top of the mountain range has a bit of a body. It has an open mouth and something which even looks a little bit like an eye. Um, and he was convinced that this was a skeleton of a giant snake. Now, 100% there could be fossils in those rocks I haven't seen. But as far as I know, there's not quite any animal that's quite that big. Now, the next one that was sent to me came with just the subject heading human finger bone. Um, now, I have gotten quite good at telling people that if you think you found human remains, contact the police. This is very much above my pay grade. Um, I do have a background in archaeology, but anything related to human remains is definitely not my job. Um, the woman who sent me this was actually from America. She had been out walking and actually looking for American Indian arrowheads, so definitely a red flag. Um, but luckily she did take um, the bone to uh, the local sheriff's department and they informed her that, ma'am, that is a rock. So luckily crisis averted there. And the last one that I wanted to show, this was probably the most recent one was that a man from New Zealand sent me um, a photo of these very cool rocks and he was convinced that these rocks were the fossilized suckers of a giant octopus. Now I'm not quite sure how he'd done his calculations, but he estimated the length of this octopus to be about 40,000 kilometers. Now, apart from some of the obvious things with fossilization, like squishy things don't fossilize very well. We don't have that many fossils of any octopus let alone one that was this massive um, but also i had to bring my physicist partner in to put some maths into it and he estimated that not only would the length of this octopus be so big that it would be wrapped around the earth several times um, the gravitational pull and weight of this singular animal would cause the earth to implode um, so again not quite a fossil they are actually iron concretions um, and they have been studied by scientists in New Zealand previously. But even if people are bringing me photos of rocks or mountain ranges or things that they're just not quite sure of, one thing that's really shone through from this is that people are curious about the world around them. And if I can give them a positive interaction, even if it is telling them that it's a rock, we wanna keep that curiosity alive because the next time they're out in nature and they find something, it could actually be the next dinosaur that we discover. Now, if you were interested in learning more about the Founder Fossil Project, it is published in the Journal of Science Communication. But I was also very realistic that when I did this thesis and when I published this paper, a majority of the people who contributed to the Savannah Fossil Survey, they're not going to read this. While I wrote it in a way that I hope someone like my mum could read with no scientific background, journal science communication may not exactly be where people go to look for information. And so in Australia, you need to go where the people go. And in Australia, that is going to the pub. So I've been able to do a number of pub talks, um, even some shows for Sydney Comedy Festival talking about the Founder Fossil Project and letting people hear about it in a place that is engaging and comfortable to them. Um, and again, hopefully in a very memorable format as well. Um, I also converted the results of the Founder Fossil Survey into some very easy to understand graphics that were posted across social media and also worked with places like ABC. So ABC is our main radio and news broadcaster in Australia. So I got to do some stuff with their social media 
speaking on podcasts, doing videos with uh, the museum and my local university. All of these things were to get this information in front of the people who should be seeing it. And probably my most favourite um, opportunity that's arisen out for me of the Founder Fossil Project has been the outreach program. So late last year, I developed a outreach program that I can take to schools and we get to talk all about dinosaurs and fossils and what to do if you find one. This has also led to some pretty amazing events for women in STEM panels, um, talking through Sky for Scientists to schools from all across the world and hopefully providing some role models um, to these kids from whatever corner of the world they are from. I myself grew up on a farm and science wasn't even on my radar until I left high school. My primary school had a total of 65 kids. I was in my year six class, I had nine people and I was one of two girls. So for any kids who are in a similar situation, it can be really hard to see how you can get out of your town and what other opportunities are out there. So this outreach program has been really important in hopefully providing a visible pathway for kids to follow in the future. And just some stats, which I'm quite proud of from this outreach program. Last year alone, I was able to speak to over 2,500 students in 151 different schools from across seven countries, as well as all of those conference talks and comedy gigs and other um, public communication. Uh, last year as well, as I mentioned, I was able to visit Dinosaur Provincial Park and continue my work at the Australian Museum. So for me, it's not just about the research and it's not just about the website, it's about getting out there into the community and talking about these issues as often the community is the one who can inspire you to find those solutions. So overall from this project, we've had some pretty amazing outcomes. The first was that we have a really comprehensive data set that can outline problems, but also illustrate some amazing solutions. It's led to the creation of the Founder Fossil website, which has so many resources for how we can better protect this heritage and raise awareness. And now it's got its own associated outreach program, and so big picture, hopefully all of this is contributing to the greater protection, stewardship and appreciation of heritage materials by communities all across Australia. And looking to the future, it's now been just over a year since I actually finished my masters, um, but I'm hoping to continue more research at the intersection of paleontology, archaeology and science communication. Just recently, I was actually invited to contribute to a special issue um, by Mike Benton. Um, and that was quite surreal because he'd heard about the Founder Fossil Project. Um, and I'm pretty sure Mike wrote all of my first year paleontology textbooks. So it was nice to be working with someone who's so esteemed and seeing that the Founder Fossil Project is getting recognized in many countries across the world. I really want to give the opportunity for people who don't always have a voice in this space to be heard whether that is farmers or miners or Aboriginal community members, and sometimes even paleontologists. How often have you been working in the lab or in the field and someone has actually asked you, how do you think we can do science communication to the public better? So that's also going to be a new project for mine. So next time I'm in Canada, keep an eye out as I will be wanting to speak to you. And the overall goal is to increase public involvement and accessibility of heritage protection through things like these school visits, community events, and social media. While we are the privileged ones who maybe get to study fossils for a living, there are so many other people who are out there who are so interested and who should also get to enjoy these fossils and this heritage. And hopefully we can fit in a few more dinosaur digs as well. So I think we can probably all agree if you're here, then you're probably interested in fossils. They're pretty amazing things. They help to tell a collective story of life on Earth. It's been a story that's gone on for more than four and a half billion years. And it's a history that is so worth protecting. And so hopefully the Founder Fossil Project is contributing to that protection. Thank you very much for listening. Great. Thank you so much, Sally, for that really fascinating talk.
Uh, it's, it's interesting that um, Australia and Canada actually have a lot of similar issues when it comes to reporting fossils. Um, as you're kind of alerting to, southern Alberta has got, we, a lot of people know about the fossils down there. Up here mm -hmm. in northern Alberta, even the locals don't always realize that there's fossils up here. And we have yeah. those same kind of issues about people being afraid to report fossils because they're afraid they'll lose their land or their favorite rec site is going to get shut down or, or, you know, whatever reason it is. Um, and so I think we're, we have the same sort of issues. Um, and so it's good. Like this project is amazing, kind of like making people aware of, of the fossil resources. And I think it's, it's applicable for us too. I mean, obviously we're in a different country and we have different fossil resources, but it's the same kind of principles apply for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question about, um, working with industry. Is that anything is that something that you ever come across? Because it is something that we run across here uh, in northern Alberta, which is quite an industrial kind of landscape. Um, is it something that that occurs in Australia? I would say for fossils, not so much. Um, I would say that our fossil sites that we actually know about are quite concentrated. And a lot of the time they are in the middle of nowhere. Um, so a lot of the dinosaur sites in Queensland, no one can really do anything with that land anyway. Um, it may not be the best for mining in some cases, so there's not a lot of industry crossover, probably more crossover with farming. Um, definitely for Aboriginal artifacts and sites, um, often they do crossover, especially with the mines. Um, so there's been a lot of contention about, okay, do we value Aboriginal history more or do we value the money that we can get from mines and the resources in the ground? So that's an ongoing battle. Um, and unfortunately, there's not always a clear end in sight for that. And kind of a similar sort of follow up question to that. Um, so here, whenever they do um, kind of big industrial work, like if they're building a road or a pipeline or whatever it is, um, in this region, they're required to have a paleontologist on site. Usually it's someone who is trained to be a consultant. Um, is, is that something that happens in Australia? Definitely not. Um, for, for Aboriginal artifacts and Aboriginal heritage, absolutely. It is a legal requirement for most new construction to have a um, survey done just to, you know, even if there is just a few stone artifacts or something, figuring out, do we return them? Do we keep them? Can we do a buffer zone? That kind of thing. But for fossils, as far as I know, there's no consideration for that. So in your area, um, if people found a fossil, um, where could they take it to be identified? Would so in New South, yeah, so in New South Wales, the go-to place is probably going to be the Australian Museum. Um, it's our big state museum that we have in New South Wales, based in Sydney, and they do have an amazing identification service called Ask an Expert, and people can take bugs, fossils, rocks, whatever they want. They can take photos or take them into the museum and get them identified. Um, there is a small paleontology department within the museum, so they can often identify things. But unfortunately, it's not the same as in Alberta, that if someone does potentially have a new dinosaur or a bigger discovery that they found, we're very limited in staffing to actually get someone to go out there and verify what that find is. So, so many inquiries just go unanswered. And it's the same with Aboriginal heritage, even though there's dedicated government departments, so many inquiries would just go completely unanswered because we don't have the people um, to kind of go out and be able to verify that. Yeah, I think like to some to some degree, we, we also have those sort of challenges as well. Uh, we recently actually this weekend had a, a fossil ID day where we encouraged people to bring in their fossils and people came in with like huge, like big bins of fossils that, you know, they've just been waiting for this opportunity. Um, so I think there is interest in people bringing in the fossils, but sometimes you have to ask. I find at least here, you have to ask them like, hey, here's this opportunity. Bring in your fossils, get them identified. No, we're not going to take them away. That's the other fear people have. hundred percent. And it's very much the same. We've seen it probably more so with, um, again, Aboriginal artifacts that people have boxes in their back sheds that they have had for generations that they're just... They're curious about them. They want to know more about the people who lived there. They just are too scared that their land would then be impacted or, or you know, these rocks have now become family heirlooms. 
even though they don't originally belong to these people, it's been passed down for so many years that they kind of now seem to have a claim on it. Um, that being said, I definitely know of quite a number of stories of um, fossils being the same, that things like opalized fossils as well, there's apparently a farmer down in South Australia or something who has this amazing fossilized um, plesiosaur, all in opal, just sitting under his bed. He doesn't really want to give it to a museum unless they can pay up. And unfortunately, museums are often underfunded, so they don't necessarily have the money to pay for that kind of display. Um, but yeah, he's just got it under his bed. So you've kind of got to wonder how many other people have these amazing finds just hidden under their beds or in their back sheds. Yeah. Is is it legal to buy and sell fossils in Australia? Or Australian um, fossils in Australia, I should say? I believe so. It depends on the fossil site. Um, so, you know, if you are the landowner and it's on your site, then I think that's okay. Um, it is quite ambiguous in places like South Australia, for example, fossils are designated as being owned by the Crown. Um, but there's like, okay, who is the Crown? How do I get in contact with the Crown? That kind of thing. So there is a federal act um, called the Protection of Movable Cultural Heritage, which does actually protect fossils from being exported or imported from other countries. But as far as I know, any of the buying and selling laws within Australia are very vague if they exist at all. It's interesting. Um, here, I think you alluded to this, but in, in Alberta, we do have fossil legislation that um, says that you can legally surface collect fossils so like pick them off the ground as long as you're outside mm -hmm. a protected area like you can't be in a, a park or a natural area or anything like that um but with the understanding that you're the custodian of that fossil like you don't own yeah. it um and so like if you were ever required to give it up to a museum for research you'd be required to do that uh, but it also means that because you don't own it you can't sell it um mm. And all paleontologists, including like professionals and amateurs alike, require a permit to actually excavate the fossil. Um, so I think that, um, you know, and we always emphasize that those legislations are in place uh, to protect the fossils for future generations. Because mm. as, as you probably know and could probably comment on, um, a fossil in a private collection is, is lost to science. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't know that either. Um, there's definitely, you know, on public fossil digs that I've talked to people and they're very much like, oh, I think private collections are great. I have my own private collection and, you know, it's entirely legal to have that. And they are some very cool specimens, but I think so many people don't realize that you're not allowed to publish on something that's in a private collection. Um, and again, I think the whole scientific publishing process of what is peer review? How does that work? How does it make our science better? Um, you know, so much of that is locked behind paywalls. And so people just don't know that, you know, we, we try and have these things in place for a reason to make the science better. That's just not always communicated to everyone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's a work in progress. And I would say like, even, even here in Alberta, um, fossil legislation is not very well known at all. I would say mm. if if we were to do the kind of survey that you did, um, I think we would actually get similar results to you, or at least again, here in Northern Alberta, Southern Alberta, like Dinosaur Bridge Park, Drum Heller, people are more aware. Um, but up here where we have the same kind of uh, volume of dinosaur fossils, it's not very well known at all. So um, I found your presentation very um, insightful and it, it's made me curious in terms of what, what results we might get if we made the same kind of survey and I suspect it would be very similar. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a very fine line of balancing between having good protective legislation, but also allowing people to, you know, not be fearful and still be curious about the world around them. Because again, so many of the finds that we come across are from the general public. We need them involved in this science. Yeah, for sure. And I'm sure it's true with you as well is that, um, we like our our museum here in North Alberta, we have to cover like vast tracts of land. Like Northern Alberta is huge. And of course, like Australia yeah. is huge as well. And so we just don't have the physical manpower to like cover all of those areas. So we also rely really heavily on our, our advocational paleontologists as well as just people, members of the public who find things and tell us about them. Yeah. So I think that's uh, kind of a, a really important message as well. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right. So I don't see any more messages in the chat. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you so much for your excellent presentation. Um, the presentation will be posted on the YouTube channel for anyone who missed it live can go and check it out there. Um, and again, if you get a chance to check out Sally's website, it's pretty awesome. You can also check out the Find a Fossil website as well. Um, so thank you again for listening. Uh, we hope you will join us in April, April 21st, I believe. Uh, we will have Corwin Sullivan from the U University of Alberta talking to us about a fossil Gia monster. Um, so thank you once again. Um, and uh, thanks, Sally, for your amazing presentation. No worries. Thank you so much.